good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's event. It is a great privilege for me as dean of the law school to welcome you to and to introduce our annual Nice Lecture in Intellectual Property Law. I do this not only on behalf of my faculty colleagues who teach in intellectual property law, Irene Calboli, Kaylee Murray, and Bruce Boyden, uh, but for our entire faculty. This lecture series stands in memory of the late Helen Wilson Nice. It began in the late 1990s when our then colleague, Professor Craig Nard, wanted to develop further our intellectual property program, and the school determined to do so with a lecture in honor of the federal circuit judge for whom he had clerked, the late Helen Wilson Nice. Professor Nard received the permission of Judge Nice's family, and we have had the benefit of the lecture ever since. Indeed, even when Professor Nard, who was my closest colleague on the faculty, departed us several years ago for Case Western Reserves Law School and his wife's hometown of Cleveland, the lecture stayed here. Craig remembers Judge Nice as a very generous individual and a hardworking, serious, and modest judge. He has especially remarked to me that although Judge Nice's own practice background was not on the technical side, she managed nonetheless as a judge of the Federal Circuit and indeed as chief judge of that court for a time to have an influence on patent law. How appropriate then, it seems to me, that this year's Nice lecture should be Jessica Lippmann, the John F. Nickel Professor of Law at the University of Michigan. Professor Lippmann is an alumna of Reed College and Columbia Law School. She is a leading scholar in intellectual property law and, like Judge Nice, is unusually and highly engaged in just about all aspects of the field, whether they are patent, copyright, trademark, or internet law. We are both fortunate and grateful that Professor Lippmann would join us here at Marquette University Law School to deliver this lecture. Professor Lippmann has selected as her title, Real Copyright Reform, and I am very much looking forward to her talk. In favor of which, I will now stand down other than to ask you to join me in welcoming this year's Nice Lecture of Professor Jessica Lippmann of the University of Michigan. Thank you for that warm welcome. Um, when I was invited to give this lecture, I asked to talk about real copyright reform. Uh, what does that mean? As someone who teaches and writes about copyright law, I end up straddling two different worlds. On the one hand, I really do need to understand and be able to teach the details of the statute, the difference between a public performance right under Section 1064 and a digital audio performance right under Section 1066. Um, my students need to know the difference between a statutory license under Section 114 and a statutory license under Section 115, so I need to have all of the details pretty well nailed down. Uh, at the same time, as an academic who writes normative and historical articles about copyright and who tries to explain to her students why the statute works or fails to work the way it does, I need to be pretty well grounded in copyright theory and in the normative premises that are supposed to underlie the law. Uh, the disconnect between these two realms is serious and it's growing. As a result, practicing copyright lawyers are finding copyright scholarship much less useful than they used to, and many copyright scholars are finding members of the copyright bar less thoughtful than they used to. Uh, this is a field in which conferences for CLE credit are common, and commonly include speakers from the practicing copyright bar and speakers from the academy, so one actually gets to see a lot of folks come and snipe at each other. Uh, and when I read and listen to what August members of the bar have to say about the work of copyright law professors, I read and hear grotesque caricatures of ideas no actual law professor I've ever met has read or said. I assume that many copyright lawyers feel something similar. Um, and that's a pity because I believe we're about to embark on the beginning phases of another round of statutory wholesale statutory copyright revision, when the groups might have a fair amount to offer one another. Now, if I'm well known, it's primarily from my work as a copyright legislative historian. 
That is, I'm the lady who sat down with every copyright bill introduced in the last 220 years and read the bills and read the hearings on the bills and read the reports and the floor debates and talked with the lobbyists and the congressional staffers and tried to figure out whether there were any patterns to what happened. It may surprise you that anyone was interested in doing that. Um, so far, only one of us, uh, and I'm she. Uh, but based on that, it looks to me as if we're in the initial stages of what's going to become an effort to overhaul the copyright statute. Now, why do I think that? Uh, well, first of all, there are moves that copyright lawyers make when the law isn't working well for them. So they avoid inconvenient statutory language by persuading courts that the words of the statute mean one thing in one context and another thing in another context. So students uh, will remember that under the 1909 Act, for example, the courts developed alternate definitions of the term publication for different purposes. Copyright lawyers will sit down with other copyright lawyers and negotiate a series of band-aid solutions in which they agree with one another that they're going to behave as if the statute on the books said what they wished it said. So under the 1909 Act, music publishers and record labels devised Harry Fox licenses to track the compulsory mechanical license where they liked it and to vary its terms where they found it inconvenient. Or although copyrights under the 1909 Act were formally indivisible, only one person could own a copyright at a time, publishers devised a series of customary practices to allow them to behave as if different copyright rights could be separately owned. In the ramp up to actual copyright revision, uh, lawyers will meet in small groups to see if they can generate agreement on what a new law ought to look like. They'll ask their pet legislators to float trial balloons. And they'll use the tools that all good lawyers have in our toolboxes to try and position themselves to claim that whatever copyright reform they seek is already well established under current law. Okay, we've been seeing a lot of that sort of thing recently. In the multiple meanings department, we have the word fixation. Advocates have persuaded some courts that fixation in tangible form means one thing for the purpose of investing copyright and a different thing for the purpose of infringing it. In the Band-Aid Solutions Department, we have notice and takedown. Lots of industry actors have informally agreed with one another to behave as if the notice and takedown provisions in Section 512 of the Copyright Statute applied to a much broader set of situations than the statute seems to contemplate. And in the Jockeying for Position Department, we have a series of efforts to claim that the exclusive right under 1063 of the copyright statute to distribute copies to the public by sale or other transfer of ownership or by rental, lease, or lending covers a very wide swathe of acts, uh, some of which include no distribution, no copies, no sale, no transfer of ownership, no rental, no lease, and no lending. So what happens next, if this era is like past ones, is a long protracted process of negotiation to come up with what will be called something like the Copyright Revision Act of 2026, uh, to be fondly known as the 26 Act for short. All right, now the reason for all this maneuvering is that the current copyright statute isn't working the way anyone would like it to. We all want the copyright system to nurture the creation, dissemination, and enjoyment of works of authorship. That's what copyright's for. When it works well, it should encourage creators to make new works, it should assist intermediaries in disseminating them widely, and it should support readers, listeners, and viewers in enjoying them. And if the copyright system poses difficult entry barriers to creators,